thank you everyone for joining our webinar this morning. Um, this is the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation Lecture Series. My name is Whitney Albright. I work here at the Department in the Science Institute. And with my colleague, Nicole Russell, we um, organize the lecture series. And um, as usual, before we get started today, I just wanna go over a few logistics for this morning. Um, as you know, we have an hour and a half set aside for the lecture today. Um, once I turn it over to our guest speakers, we'll have around 45 minutes to an hour for the presentation itself. And then we'll have time for dedicated questions at the end of the presentation. And we might also stop and, and pause and take a few questions throughout too. So I do encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box there um, as they come up and I'll make sure to get all of those relayed to our speakers. Um, you've probably already noticed that you are all muted and that is to help us preserve the audio quality for our recording. We are recording the talk today and we will try to get that up, that recording up on our website within the next couple of weeks. There's a link to the lecture series website there at the bottom of the slide. So that's where we will um, post the recording if you want to check it out again or if you know of anyone who missed the talk today but might be interested, feel free to direct them there. Um, and also because you're muted, do please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'll, like I said, make sure to get those relayed to the speakers. Okay, let's see here. With that, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers today. Um, we are going to be hearing about Stephen's Kangaroo Rat um, Range-Wide Management and Monitoring Plan this morning. And we have four guest speakers, which is incredible. So instead of reading their, um, going through their full bios today, I'm just going to introduce everyone and their kind of title and organization. But we did post everyone's full biographies to our lecture series website. So I encourage you to go check those out if you'd like to learn a, bit, a little bit more about our speakers today. So we will be hearing today from Princess Hester. She's the Director of Administration with the Riverside County Habitat Conservation Agency. We'll also hear from Brian Shomo who is a Director of Natural Resources with the Riverside County Habitat Conservation Agency. We'll hear from Wayne Spencer, Chief Scientist with the Conservation Biology Institute. And we'll also hear from Deanne Di Pietro, the Senior Science Coordinator with the Conservation Biology Institute. So thank you all so much for joining us today and talking about this topic. I'm very excited to hear about this plan um, and all of the work that you've been doing. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys to kick us off here. Thank you, Whitney. And uh, good morning, everyone. And so today uh, we are presenting the Stevens Kangaroo Rat Range-Wide Management and Monitoring Plan. And as Whitney said, I'm Princess Hester. I'm the Director of Administration for the Riverside County Habitat Conservation Agency. We are a joint powers agency that consists of 10 cities and the county of Riverside in Southern California. And we're responsible for managing the, um, habit, uh, the Stevens Kangaroo Rat Habitat Conservation Plan. We manage approximately 40,000 acres of species, um, 40,000 acres of land in Western Riverside County. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're gonna to be presenting to you our um, range-wide management and monitoring program. You're gonna hear some background. We'll talk about the partners and how this project got started, um, why the need for range-wide approach was very important, um, not just for the RCHCA, but especially for Stevens Kangaroo Rat. We'll provide you with an overview of the plan, introduce some SKR adaptive management information and show you how the cycle works. We'll also give you some demonstrations of putting the plan into action so you can actually see how it's supposed to work. We'll talk about our next steps, which is implementing the plan, and then we'll provide you some recommendations on implementation and adaptive refinement as it relates to the plan and the information we presented. Next slide. So this project um, became possible um, as a result of funding that we received from the Bureau of Land Management through the Recovery and Sustain Sustainment Partnership Initiative. Basically, Bureau of Land Management is really responsible for managing um, you know, hundreds of acres of land that um, protect endangered species. 
For Stevens kangaroo rat in particular, this species range includes areas of Western Riverside County and Northern San Diego County. So as we even talked about developing this plan, as you can imagine, we had to um, employ uh, tactics that involved uh, cross county jurisdictions, um, involving cities, the military establishments, et cetera, et cetera. And so we received this funding in order to support the plan. BLM contracted with the RCHCA, and we then contracted with Conservation Biology Institute, particularly for their expertise and leadership in putting these types of groups together and their scientific expertise in working on species management. Next slide. So why is this important? Um, as I mentioned early, um, the species has a cross-boundary cross um, range. And so it, we're, the species of SKR is in Northern San Diego County, as well as Western Riverside County. And even though all of those agencies have objectives in managing for SKR, even though we share, uh, we have different objectives, we still share a common goal. And so it was important to standardize population monitoring because right now data is being collected under different habitat conservation plans or under different NCCPs. And so we needed to standardize the population monitoring. In addition to that, we needed to work together to facilitate better management so that we can begin to focus the resources on where they're needed um, and to be able to employ some of the adaptive management techniques that the RCHCA has worked on for many years in helping to recover the species. It will assist us with future status assessments, especially for the Fish and Wildlife uh, Service, as well as CDFW, to really be able to compare apples to apples um, once you're looking at that data, um, as opposed to trying to compile data that's collected in different methodologies from different organizations. And in addition to that, we want to advance our range-wide SKR recovery goals, which is in the end to be able to recover this species and show demonstration of that recovery. And so that is why this particular plan was very important. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Wayne Spencer, and he's gonna talk more to you about the uh, plan. Thank you. Thank you, Princess. Um, can I be heard okay? Okay, um, so I'm gonna give a quick overview of, of the plan, kind of what's in it, but, um, and then delve a little bit more into some of the major kind of new innovations or scientific tasks we had to undertake to, to get this plan. So uh, an overview, it was intended to kind of um, be a one-stop shopping for all the most relevant up-to-date information on SKR. Um, including habitat, status, threats, genetics, et cetera. Um, so a synthesis of, of all the current SKR science, um, and then to provide three major components, the, a management strategy range-wide that can be used on individual reserves, but also you know, with, with a management toolbox of sort of lessons learned from management by, again, multiple agencies over many years, uh, what works, what doesn't. Um, all of that summarized. What is the range-wide strategy and what's the toolbox for implementing it? Um, a range-wide monitoring strategy, which was perhaps the toughest nut to crack for reasons that Princess um, touched on, the multiple agencies, different techniques, et cetera, different mandates under various regulations. Um, and then finally, a, a framework for then coordinating all of this, including managing the data, uh, communicating, uh, sharing resources, all of that. So it's all in the document, which is heavily linked <laughs> to sources, uh, citations, et cetera. Next, please. So I wanna just kind of point to four highlights of uh, kind of new, tasks that we undertook to, to get to this point of that new synthesis and new applications. One was a sort of a cutting edge habitat suitability model, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. And from that, um, a biogeographic working map, or what I'm thinking of now is a, a multiple maps on database and that are tracking tools for all of the information on the species, uh, status trends, habitat changes, et cetera. Um, we did a new threats assessment across the range and we compiled the ongoing 
uh, and emerging genetics information, um, mainly from San Diego uh, Zoo Wildlife Alliance, formerly San Diego Zoo Global. Um, anyway, so, so they were part of the team too, Deb uh, Deborah Shire and Rachel Chalk from San Diego Zoo. Um, and we compiled their latest population genetics research. So I'll touch on some of those items in a little more depth now. Next. The habitat suitability model was the first huge um, missing piece in a range-wide plan for SKR. So that was the first task we did. And basically this is a, a statistical SKR habitat value model uh, based on many years of survey and monitoring data um, and using environmental variables like um, terrain variables, climate variables, et cetera. But the new innovation uh, was to incorporate variables derived from multispectral satellite imagery at quite fine resolution. Um, this is very important because satellite imagery is regularly updated, so it can be a, a habitat tracking tool whereas static maps like traditional vegetation maps are not very systematically and regularly updated. So for a habitat tracking device, we needed this updatable system. Um, and it, those who are really familiar with SKR biology, one of the, the holy grails has always been a, a good way of actually using GIS or spatial modeling to map habitat because traditional GIS layers like soils and, and especially vegetation are just too coarse in terms of what they portray to capture the nuances of, of habitat value. For example, <laughs> annual grassland is the most common habitat type as mapped in SKR range, but in reality, they're not in dense annual grasslands, they're in forb lands, uh, open ground with lots of annual forbs and that is difficult to map, but with the satellite imagery, we could get at those fine scale uh, nuances of habitat value. Um, and then once you have the habitat value map, it can be mapped in uh, or model, it can be mapped in multiple ways. So here, for example, on the top, you see a more continuous habitat value version where the darkest green is the highest value and then you tail off to the yellows and browns, which are lower quality according to the model. Or you can just do a binary map like on the bottom of suitable or unsuitable. That might be useful, for example, for identifying where surveys are required or identifying where sample plots for monitoring may be dropped randomly. So there's different uses for this habitat model once we have it. Next. To illustrate that a bit, um, we have used it to do a first draft of what we call SKR habitat and population units. The map on the right shows um, sort of occupied versus occupancy unknown. Um, that's the darker kind of maroon for where the pink is. We don't know if SKR are present or they're most likely absent, but it could be lack of survey effort. So this is one way to use the data to kind of show where we know the species occurs and doesn't. Um, and to do this, we used SKR spatial ecology and the habitat value map, um, things like dispersal distance and the size of units that can support a population to sort of delineate these uh, kind of habitat units within which SKR may be interbreeding and, and call those population units for purposes of designing monitoring um, and management programs. And so this can be used to track um, changes in the suitability and distribution of both habitat and the population. Next. So here's another look at a different way to look at the habitat and population units. In this map, um, the, each color represents uh, clusters of suitable habitat by one measure, um, a fairly conservative measure of how high a value does it take to support populations of the species. But all of the in one color um, are within an easy dispersal distance for SKR. So presumably within a color, 
Uh, the animals are more likely to intermix as a local population versus different colors. It probably is rare or very infrequent or maybe no dispersal between. So these are separate population units or draft for the time being. One of the first steps, and we'll wrap this up with um, what the next implementation steps need to be, but early this year, um, we need to update these with new data and importantly with expert input, refine the delineation of these units um, in order to determine what the sampling units are, the spatial units are for the monitoring uh, program. So that's um, another use of this habitat value model. Next. Um, another thing I mentioned, the, the biogeographic mapping, this is just on databasin, databasin.org. We have a group and uh, this is available to the public where all of the most relevant data sets are collated on one or more maps that you can navigate and look at SKR distribution, the current habitat value map, the population and habitat units, um, the survey data is sort of a one-stop shopping for the spatial information. And you can create and download and upload your own data and, and so on to this thing. So that's a, a working system for implementation of the plan, part of the adaptive management um, updating. So as every year, say we have a new habitat value model, as things change, that can be added or replaced. Um, into this working biogeographic map. And as we get new genetic information, that can be incorporated. Next. Um, and then finally, I mentioned we helped synthesize the most up-to-date understanding of population genetics, working with Deborah Shire and Rachel Chalk at San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. They've done a lot of uh, studies on how fragmentation affects SKR, um, and we're looking at where improved connectivity, for example, between those population units, if they're, if they're divided by development or a road, that sort of thing. Um, we can identify where those connectivity improvements are most important, and importantly, where populations or subpopulations are now completely isolated and inbred. Um, for example, we believe that's the case on the Ramona grasslands population of, of SKR. Possibly translocations or reintroductions may be required or, or genetic augmentation by adding individuals from one subpopulation to another. None of those decisions are made yet. The um, sort of coordination structure, decision-making structure that Princess will describe later um, we'll have a decision-making body to help identify when and where these sorts of things are advised, but the plan sets up the process and the tools necessary to, de to make those decisions. Um, and of course, improved uh, population monitoring using genetics re uh, research. Um, we're hoping to move, although we, we do, we have designed a kind of a traditional uh, occupancy modeling and and population density monitoring program with trapping, um, we're hoping and planning that this could be transitioned more to genetic monitoring of effective population size uh, with new genomic techniques. Anyways, that's all summarized in the plan. Uh, next. And I believe, well, no, the threats assessment was one new thing we did. Um, threats to SKR are already pretty well known and well documented. Obviously, habitat fragmentation and loss, um, uh, dense thatch, um, invasive uh, species, et cetera, um, are all known threats to SKR. But what we wanted to do and what we did was distribute a detailed questionnaire spreadsheet to all the reserve managers that have SKR um, responsibilities to get their individual assessments on their reserves locally of the, the severity and nature of all the threats um, and ranking those. And what that did was allow us to kind of reinforce what's already known about the actual, the range-wide threats to the species. Um, there were no huge surprises there. 
Uh, but it also identified where there's variance amongst reserves or regionally and where there may be local threats that, um, you know, specific invasive species like stink net um, or perhaps uh, predation by house cats or other exotic predators. So it allowed us to kind of better get a, an estimate of range-wide threats, but also how it varies geographically. For example, light pollution is locally a threat in some places, but definitely not in others. Um, so next, I believe I'm handing off to Brian here to talk more about um, the major components of the plan moving forward. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, my name is Brian Shemo. As uh, Whitney introduced me earlier, uh, for the last 15 years, my job at the RCHDA has been primarily to coordinate the land management across those 46,000 acres that Princess alluded to earlier. And just to give you a bit of background, within that 46,000 acres in Western Riverside County of California, uh, we have eight nature reserves, and each of those reserves has multiple owners. Well, most of the larger ones have multiple owners. For instance, the Lake Matthews Reserve has four owners. The Southwest Multi-Species Reserve has five owners. Uh, the Petrero Reserve has two owners. And so what you realize after a short period of time of being here and trying to coordinate this, that there's many plans, uh, many landowners, there's multiple HCPs within these areas, the overall big MSHCPs, the multi-species habitat conservation plans, the littler HCPs, and then specific management plans for the area. What was lacking and was so hard to achieve uh, was a coherent strategy uh, going forward. And so this plan attempts to basically put all that management strategy into a conservation toolbox more or less. And it goes into the management strategy, it goes into the monitoring strategy, data management and adaptive management cycle, the coordination structure, and we'll take a deeper dive from this point forward into each one of those, uh, beginning with the management uh, strategy. And so as Wayne said earlier, uh, it really becomes a one-stop shop for all this managing for SKR. And we try to put all the tools in the toolbox that we had available. And we realized that not every landowner uh, will be able to use those tools, every tool in the toolbox. For instance, Metropolitan Water District has a lot, a lot of restrictions around grazing animals around drinking water uh, because of cryptosporidium and other parasites that could get into the water supply. So we threw them all in there and each land manager will have the option to use whatever tools available. Um, we tried to summarize the desired conditions and methods for managing those SKR habitats and populations and those threats. Uh, we try to provide guidance uh, for strategically planning where and when these tools should be used, how they should be used. Uh, for instance, grazing traditionally has been to put a lot of animals into a small area and then move that fence, you know, around those animals and keep going to one acre, two acre, three acre sites. We're, now we're moving towards grazing those animals in a manner that's more like traditional or historic herbivore behavior, where we're just moving them across the landscape, clipping those seed heads on those non-native grasses and continually moving them uh, from one area to the other. Uh, in the attempt at subsequent years, there's less and less seed available and the grass density decreases. So really the management strategy it's kind of like the general contractor in a sense, and it just provides the blueprint for, for building the house of Stephen, if you will. And so next slide. Some of the things we included in the toolbox uh, for ha habitat management, population management, and threat management are again, those tools. Uh, specifically, we try to get the grass to dirt ratio around 50-50 for SKR by summer. Uh, so we include methods of grazing. It's an excellent tool for doing large scale management uh, across thousands of acres. Mechanical treatments such as mowing uh, for specific type areas, uh, not really useful for, you know, thousand acres or so uh, on an uneven terrain, but again, another tool in the toolbox, how to use fire, maybe to set the foundation and to stack other treatments on top of that in order to prolong the, the interval between burns. Uh, and then even some things such as decompacting soil, some methods for doing that. As far as population management is concerned, we include information about dispersal improvements. Uh, how can we better make corridors and linkages between potentially suitable habitat patches for SKR? Um, and as Wayne mentioned, translocation and reintroduction. Uh, we have a great translocation plan that was developed by the San Diego Zoo for SKR to reintroduce it into extirpated areas, uh, maybe as a result of that habitat fragmentation. Also, again, as a result of the fragmentation, the rapid 
urbanization in Southern California, uh, that, ha that translocation plan could be used for genetic augmentation to avoid inbreeding depression and stuff within those species. Uh, threat management, again, Wayne spoke to this a little bit earlier, uh, but we include resources for minimizing those threats, such as those house cats, those non-native predators, movement barriers, excess of light, et cetera. So with that, just a you know, 50,000 foot overview of some of the things that are available in that manager's toolbox as far as management strategies and tools that are available. Uh, again, one-stop shop, as Wayne said, and I'll turn it back over to Wayne uh, to talk about, about the, man the monitoring strategy. Yep, sorry about that, <laughs> went offline. Um, yeah, so this was one of the more difficult things to tackle. It's always been um, a problem that we have all these different HCPs and preserved and non-preserved areas with different sorts of monitoring uh, that could not easily be comp compiled into really a range-wide assessment of species status and trends which is obviously something that under the Endangered Species Act, um, state and federal agencies are required to track. Um, so we, and th there's difficulties because of uh, different um, requirements under H under the different HCPs, MSHCPs, uh, habitat management plans, military lands, et cetera, all have sort of different requirements on what their conservation targets or goals are and what methods are required of them and, and so on. So there's that, but also um, it's just difficult. It, it was difficult without a range wide uh, foundation, a habitat value map, um, to allocate or distribute some sort of sampling regime that can give a range-wide view. So um, we have this new habitat value model and it can be updated uh, at least annually, if, if not more frequently, um, seasonally in some cases, to track how modeled habitat value changes over time. For example, with, with uh, management actions like mowing or grazing, but also weather events and, and things like that. Um, we'll couple that with some field evaluation to try and correlate ground level um, monitoring data, vegetation data with the, what the habitat value model is showing. Um, that's one way or a couple of ways of tracking habitat change at the range wide scale. Uh, the toughest thing was population monitoring. And what we landed on was using uh, range-wide occupancy trapping, largely modeled after what the USGS has already been implementing on military lands, Mar uh, Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton and the Na Navy uh, Air Station Fallbrook. Um, they've been using an occupancy modeling framework, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about. And we've expanded the concept and standardized it range wide. Um, and coupled with that is a, is a local population density index. Um, the occupancy and the occupancy and density um, data are collected with live trapping methods and then genetic diversity, as I mentioned earlier, and effective population size, we're hoping to be able to, or um, we have initial baseline data from, from the San Diego Zoo uh, Wildlife Alliance, but we're hoping to move towards a genetic monitoring program of genetic diversity, inbreeding depression, uh, population, connectivity and, and especially effective population size. So uh, I'm gonna go a little more depth into the occupancy trapping, which is really the essential tool for range-wide status and trends tracking of the population. Next. Um, oh, I wanted to mention that um, in addition to uh, achieving these goals, we wanted to design the program to, to the uh, most uh, possible leverage existing monitoring efforts and not not reinvent wheels or impose new burdens on managers, but try and work with what they're already doing and shape it into a more standardized method. 
um, and to evaluate uh, effectiveness of conservation measures and inform uh, adaptive management decisions, obviously. And um, Brian will show you more about the adaptive management cycle and how those, how that, um, how new monitoring data inform management decisions. And then also using monitoring to identify new research and funding priorities. Next. So an overview of the percent area occupied sampling design, I won't go into detail and math and so on, but um, the idea is to distribute standardized trapping grids uh, across the entire range in higher ha value habitat areas and trap with standardized protocols when the species is most detectable, which is generally late summer and fall, which it may vary somewhat regionally, uh, coastal areas versus inland areas. So that's something to be worked out with the exact timing of trapping is. But the idea with this uh, percent area occupied approach to uh, status and trends monitoring is to try and maximize your probability of detecting a species given that it's present. So if you're trapping for the species, what's your probability of actually capturing an individual given that the animals are, are living on the grid? Um, it's, and that's one of the reasons to trap in late summer, fall. Um, to maximize that probability. And then you wanna get the range of the probability that a grid is actually occupied somewhere in the 50-50 range. In other words, you don't want to put grids in a whole lot of places where you know you're not gonna catch them or only in places where you know you are going to catch them. Either, either end of, that ex, of those extremes, um, really weakens your power, it, it weakens the information you're getting. It's not very useful. Um, but if you can kind of hit the sweet spot of near a 50% occupancy rate of actual occupancy of the animals across the grids that you're monitoring, uh, you have the most power to detect changes. And so um, this, this is just a table of an example of what's called a power analysis to then determine how many grids do you need? That's kind of the bugaboo. And there was a great fear. I had a great fear that it would be thousands, <laughs> you know, an unattainable number. Um, but just glancing at this table, what um, the sunny pit, the, the funny little pitchfork symbol uh, there, that's the, pro that's the actual occupancy of the grids you're trapping. So if you look at 0.6, that's assuming that 60% of the grids that you drop on the landscape actually have SKR. And then go over to 50, uh, the P is the probability of capturing them given that they're there. So if you have a 50-50 chance of catching animals um, and 60% of the grids that you trap actually have animals, you can then look over to how many trapping grids do you need? And it depends on your, the management sensitivity. In this case, if you want to be able to detect a change in population of 30% or more, say from 100 animals or 100,000 animals to 130,000 animals, you would need to have 100, 128 grids at, with these parameter estimates, which is actually doable over such a large landscape in so many agencies. And if you only want to detect a 50% change, um, maybe we just assume that SKR, they fluctuate uh, naturally over time and you don't get concerned until there's at least a 50% change. You'd only need 48 or about 50 grids. So this is a decision-making tool that um, in this first phase of implementation, the experts will get together. That is experts both in doing the monitoring and experts in the statistical design um, to get our heads together and do our best estimates of these probabilities and then um, determine how many grids do we need for the first year or two of trapping. Once we have results from that first year or two, all the numbers can be updated with that new information and the, and the system can be refined. The good news here is that these numbers are not outrageous. I know Brian was on, on a hot seat there. Next. 
Um, now I'm going to hand it off, I believe, to Deanne, who is our expert in data management, um, for what happens with all the data that this will generate. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Um, this is Deanne DiPietro. I worked on several aspects of the plan with the team, um, including helping to coordinate the over 100 people that worked with us on this all. Um, we called the SKR Working Group. And uh, so the SKR range-wide plan has a data management strategy section, which outlines the steps we will need to take to make it possible to coordinate our monitoring at the reserves and to combine the data into a single database to inform all of this decision-making that Princess and, and Brian and, and Wayne have talked about. So these include developing standards for collecting and aggregating the data based on the standardized monitoring protocols, which um, we have a little more work to do to completely refine. And then we'll base these uh, data structure standards on what has been developed already largely. There's a lot of good work that's been done by uh, DOD and USGS and Fish and Wildlife. Um, so we will move quickly to standardize those data sets once we're finished with the monitoring protocols. And uh, another piece of the equation is to establish a data manager and a centralized data portal. And someone asked about um, if we're going to share data on the BIOS viewer. Uh, that is an example of a great way to get, um, to make data accessible. And so we are going forward into the next year to really nail these pieces down. Where will this data reside? Who is going to be uh, the steward of it? And so um, we invite CDFW to be part of this conversation to develop, to, to implement this management strategy. In the plan, we describe the components of it. Um, so we'll have that centralized data portal, and we also want to offer the reserve managers tools to make data collection in these standard um, methods as easy as possible, such as standardized forms um, and hopefully a collector app, which um, is an electronic device to take into the field to capture that data. Next slide. Um, so this all leads us to uh, what we call the SKR adaptive management cycle. And as uh, you have heard, these data will be aggregated uh, from all the reserves and um, put together and used in this um, manner to inform the next round of monitoring and also management decisions. Um, so all of these components that you've heard Princess and Wayne and Brian talking about that are in the plan, make it possible for us to continue to update information about the species across its range, helping inform subsequent years management decisions. Um, and so the plan describes this annual adaptive monitoring and management cycle where the aggregated data from the reserves along with the regularly updated habitat suitability model are used to reevaluate the habitat and population units that Wayne described because they need to be updated every um, year, ideally. And these help us decide where to monitor the following year. Next slide. Uh, there's another piece of this management cycle that possibly um, doesn't repeat on an annual basis, but uh, is a little bit longer term cycle. So in, in addition to the yearly cycle of range-wide monitoring at the reserves, there is a range-wide management and policy decision-making cycle. So that's the purple right-hand side. We'll use the updated habitat and population units along with the latest genetics research to update the species status and trends, then refine recommendations for management and decide about the next needed research uh, and also collaboratively seek funding for the, um, the needs of managers and um, the specific 
things that need to be done that we identify are important after evaluating the species status and trends across its whole range. For example, a translocation project or um, maybe particular um, reserves don't have the resources for stink net removal, for example, will collaborate to decide where to um, put those resources, resources and seek that funding. Um, and we can also advise policymakers. And so that um, feeds back into promoting range-wide management priorities, which goes back to the reserves um, to know what to do next. Next slide. So to accomplish all this at a range-wide scale, we'll need to coordinate. And the plan recommends establishing groups who will need to work on all of these steps. Um, for example, a designated data manager, as I mentioned, will aggregate the, the data. A technical team will analyze it and assemble all the latest science. An implementation team will make management and policy decisions using that integrated science and the recommendations from the technical team. And reserve managers are the ones implementing the management and monitoring uh, recommendations and actions. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the section of the plan we call the range-wide coordination structure. Uh, describes these teams and what we need them to do. And there they are listed. Um, stakeholders are everybody. So together, these groups are defined um, as this range-wide coordination structure. And they're composed of the people that helped create this plan. I mentioned the SKR working group, which was over 100 people from more than 30 agencies and organizations that are the stakeholders of SKR management. So this is a multi-agency effort that is taking a range-wide view to SKR conservation. Uh, next slide. So uh, here we are in our outline. Uh, next is uh, kind of a, a shift in the sections. I think it might be um, just a good moment to take a quick look at if there are any questions. There are two I see in the chat box about monitoring. Um, Whitney, do you want me to read those? I think they're for Wayne. Yes, yeah. Um, if you want to stop and take a few questions, we've got a couple there and then a couple in the Q&A. Um, is now a good time to get those answered? Yeah, I think before we move on, while we're thinking about monitoring, there's a couple monitoring specific questions. Sure. Uh, see those, Wayne? Or do you want me yes. to? Yes. Yeah. I, hello, this is Wayne. Um, I typed an answer to one of the questions, but um, yes, we landed on a standardized trapping grid, uh, Sherman Live traps, three nights in a five by five trap, so a 25 trap grid um, at approximately 15 meter inner trap spacing. Um, and that was sort of a compromise between what's already being implemented for a number of years by USGS on the military lands where they used that method, but at a smaller 10 meter spacing. So a slightly smaller spatial grid and RCHCA using a 15 meter spacing. Um, and the thinking there, not to get into the weeds, but slightly larger grid increases your likely capture probability a bit. Um, and it's a, a fairly standard method that a lot of trappers use. Um, and it gives us good uh, probabilities of capture based on the USGS and, and data from Steve Montgomery's uh, years of trapping and so on. Um, that system works really well. And uh, one of the things we were very concerned about was again, the the continuity, not giving managers an extra new burden or changing things so dramatically that their previous uh, data from previous monitoring became you know, useless or couldn't be continued forward. So in the case of like on Camp Pendleton where USGS has been using slightly smaller grids, uh, 
the number of grids they would need to trap to contribute to range wide is lower than the number of grids they're already trapping for the uh, preserves for, for the reserve military reserve specific trapping. So they could have a mix if they wanted of um, continuing their 10 meter grids, but supplementing with or transitioning some to a slightly larger size. Anyways, a lot more in the weeds than your question called for, but yeah, th there is a standard trapping grid that's all spelled out and the methods are all spelled out in the plan, including collecting genetic samples and so on. So, um... Someone pointed out that they can't see the questions. Um, so the questions there were uh, asking to describe the sampling grid and how many traps and um, details about the monitoring protocol, which are of course uh, in the plan. And another question is how can we get access to the plan? Um, we have a, a slide about that, but we can just quickly tell you to go straight to the RCHCA website rchca.us, and we'll have a slide about that as well. Um, okay, so I think we can move along. And uh, so the there next- was one more, There was one more question that I don't the, know the answer again, and that is, are data layers going to be added to CDFW's bio viewer? Hmm. Yes, um, yes, I answered that in the chat, and um, we would absolutely um, be very happy to share data there. That's a great place to, to put these data, data layers. Um, I also pointed out that due to the dynamic nature of this plan and the way we intend to update every year, those data will be changing and being used live online. Um, and we have a, a resource set up for that in database. And, but as I mentioned, um, you know, getting access, uh, providing access to this data is important and we will be making, um, taking further steps to establish that data management structure and the bio system um, could very well play an important role in that. Um, and Deanne, we, have, we also have several questions that have come into the Q&A chat box. Um, so I'm happy to relay those to you now. I can read those aloud or we can wait till the end. Um, they mostly come in during um, Wayne and Brian's portions of the, the presentation. Right, thank you. So up to you if you guys wanna tackle those now or we can save them. Yeah, I'm willing to tackle them now. Uh, some of them are pretty brief and okay. can be explained relatively easy. So uh, the first one I think is, when, do you wanna read it or do you want us to read it or? Do it. Regarding the genetic monitoring <laughs> cost range yeah. and how extensive it was. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, we, how comprehensive is the genetic monitoring across the range? Wayne, do you want to answer that? Uh, I can, sure, I can handle it and you can back me up. Um, okay. Yeah, I forget exactly how many, I think it was like 23 populations, Brian. Right, and we took about 20 samples at each site. Yeah. Uh, in coordination with the San Diego Zoo's, I think what their new name is, Wildlife Alliance. Uh, yeah. And so it was quite extensive across the range. And now the next step in the genetic uh, sampling is to refine that uh, to a more finer scale and see more variation uh, locally, yeah. I guess. Uh, so it was quite extensive and it was a multi-year operation and involved all the uh, sites previously uh, conducted in Riverside County with additional sites added. And then most of San Diego County where SKR uh, were located at. Yeah, that was, um, and so uh, Deborah Shire and Rachel Chalk have, have analyzed what they've gotten so far and uh, is primarily looked at uh, spatial structuring, population structuring and found basically um, a decline in population uh, genetic diversity from north to south. So up by Lake Matthews, um, there's quite high genetic diversity. And the further south you go into the Camp Pendleton and Ramona, Lake Henshaw uh, in San Diego County, those areas have lower genetic diversity there. And um, the Ramona population has the lowest diversity and is most closely related to the Rancho Wajito population to the north, um, which is on private ranch land. Um, 
but th there does seem to be, you know, th there's um, evidence of structuring where some populations like Ramona may be completely isolated. And for example, Camp Pendleton may be, and Fallbrook area may be isolated. So all of that is kind of hypothetical right now. We have hints, um, but the proposal is that with this PAO sampling trapping, we will get a lot more genetic samples at a lot more uh, localities so that they can look even finer resolution. For example, places like Rancho Ujito, there are two separate grassland areas that are somewhat, there are more than a easy dispersal distance apart. Are they operating as two population units or one? So there's a lot of hypotheses like that, that we can test once we implement the monitoring program. So I think the answer to your question is two part. It's to date, we've got a lot, um, 23 localities that are well sampled and give us some hints about population structure. But going forward, it should be more comprehensive to give us even better resolution information. Okay. And then as far as uh, somebody has a question here about decompacting clay soils, uh, and again, we don't really deal with clay soils in SKR habitat, um, you know, as you do in the Central Valley, uh, typically SKR like a sandy loam type soil. And what we would recommend probably is a light scrape, like a light raking with a harrow or a very shallow disking in order to crack the surface up. Uh, clay soils are like concrete. And if you have to decompact that, I, I, I don't envy you. <laughs> so I don't really have a good recommendation on how to do that. Uh, and as far as our annual grassland sites, uh, I see there's a question here, which it says on annual grassland sites, which you manage with grazing or mowing, is there a specific height or percent cover or residual dry matter level that you are seeking as optimal or necessary for SKR habitat viability? Uh, yes. And so we, again, I mentioned it earlier, it, we aim for about a 50-50% cover to uh, dirt ratio, uh, vegetation to dirt ratio. The height, not necessarily so important, but the density and the, th the thatch thickness. Uh, we don't like a lot of thatch. The animals forage by um, collecting seed in the soil and then packing their cheek pouches and whatnot and caching that seed. So they need to get down to the dirt. And so we don't like to see a, a, you know, a really dense uh, grass cover or a dense thatch thickness. And so that's what we're looking for. And from our perspective, we make it pretty simple for our sheep producer, uh, the shepherd that's out there with those sheep. We make a one meter by one meter grid, divide it into four quadrants with some string, and we tell him to put it on the ground. And we kind of look at it and, you know, he can measure and estimate 50% uh, cover from there and keep moving on. Uh, the important thing is we don't want them in one area until it goes down to bare dirt and becomes a dust bowl. So we move them continually across the landscape uh, daily, uh, even within the same day. They might graze an area in the morning and then graze an area in the evening. Um, and so that strategy is really a moderate disturbance. Uh, we cycle through probably three or four months of grazing each year, you know, beginning in February, ending in late, you know, April, May-ish. Uh, so again, they're really circulating around. And the idea isn't to create instantaneously good SKR habitat as a prescribed burn might uh, produce but rather over the course of me one, two, three years, uh, less and less seed is available. And so the density of those grasses goes down. Uh, so that would be the answer to that. Uh, and then I well, see- me, Brian, can I just add a little bit Absolutely. more on, on that question? Yep. Um, yeah, so, so we, we do summarize existing sort of rules of thumbs from previous studies in the plan. Um, you know, nothing concrete, like thou shalt do this, Mm -hmm. But um, residual dry matter was part of the question, too, which in previous work that CBI did um, with the Nature Conservancy on the Ramona grasslands, probably more than a decade ago now, we did have we did um, set up a management and monitoring program there that um, was based on residual dry matter in at the end of the growing season, September, October, and i uh, I shouldn't cite numbers off the top of my head, but I believe ideal was down to 1500 um, and recommended below 25 or 3,100, um, what is it, pounds per acre, whatever, <laughs> I forget what <laughs> residual dry matter metrics are, but we did have targets in there, but we, um, 
I think that work and what we've learned from the range wide view is that those may need to be somewhat reserve specific because we have a lot of geographic variation and vegetation and soils and climate where different rules of thumb may be applicable in different um, regions or on different preserves. So grain of salt, but there are targets that are summarized in the plan. And then there's one last question regarding the use of USGS Camp Pendleton grids that work well and the data collected is solid. Why not simply use that method for monitoring? If we don't, would USGS not be compatible with the range-wide monitoring? Yeah, I, I think I, I tried to answer that already. Um, okay, I, we just got another um, data point on that. Yeah, there are, <laughs> there's also six by six grids and uh, there, there's a wide array of different grids and we, um, we picked what we thought was most, um, you know, the best balance of all. Uh, we, we're, gonna <laughs> what, we're gonna have to make changes to one technique or another <laughs> in order to hit on something that's standard. But back to the question about um, why not just use the USGS uh, method everywhere? Um, and part of the answer is that, yet yeah, the power analysis suggests that they're already trapping more grids than they need to, to contribute to the range-wide status and trends. So they continue their own grids but either supplement or replace some, maybe an overlap or transition period, that, that's to be worked out with them as we move forward um, so that we're meeting both goals. They have a continuous data stream using one method, but transition over or also contribute to the range wide with a, a slightly different protocol. And it, it might be worth mentioning that um, the people who develop those protocols have been working closely with us on our monitoring subgroup as yep. part of uh, the creation of the section about monitoring on this in this plan. And yeah, there is another yeah, out at Warner Springs, they're monitoring six by six grids over a hundred meter um, grid. And these are all overlapping that we don't really know how the probability of capture directly changes with those different configurations? That's an interesting question for analysis moving forward, but sort of a compromise that is close for, for everyone was what we had to land on. Okay, and then you guys have another answer in the, uh, another question in the chat. How well do the habitat suitability models explain why exactly the habitat is suitable? An idea comes to mind, trophic symbosis ladders for connectivity, connect the small dots, is adding water table surface, flows, depth, layers, monitoring relevant for this species? And how well does sampling match the novel satellite suitability model from sampling? They're saying, wouldn't trapping during the fall affect or interfere the SKR breeding's fitness? And lastly, what other species co-benefit from SKR specific measures or how might they be combinatorial to serve multiple trophic levels. We wow. can break those that's down those, if you want. That's a whole slew of questions. I was gonna yeah. say, Wayne, do you wanna take the first couple and I can take- <laughs> give You guys wanna save the those couple. to the end? You wanna save that, those, that yeah, list that's, of that's questions? That's probably a lengthy conversation and some of those might be answered going Probably go through, like yeah. How it works so can, real world. I think, yeah, some of that's answered going forward and some of that um, in the interest of time, I'd say read the plan. <laughs> okay. And, uh, okay. Habitat suitability model is detailed. There's an appendix with all the details and how it's tested and what the accuracy is and all of that. Okay. <laughs> and and also we can invite people to join mm -hmm. us going forward in the implementation phase to make decisions about these things. Um, okay. I'm. Um, Handing it off to Brian now to show us um, a little bit more about what it will look like to put the plan into action. Brian? All right. Thank you, Deanne. Um, so hopefully I answer some of those questions that was just asked in this section. So the, the idea is how does this work out in the real world? Um, and, and Wayne kind of alluded to some of my heartburn going forward because, you know, 
my job is to coordinate on the ground actions uh, for this agency to promote, you know, SKR conservation and population increases, whatnot throughout Riverside County. And so it has to be practical. I've seen a lot of plans over the years. Uh, they get written, they're great plans, but they're so complicated, they're not practical enough and they add additional burdens to landowners that they wind up being put on a shelf. Uh, so from the land manager's perspective, we're really cognizant of trying not to increase any additional burden and trying to accommodate all the existing monitoring plans that we could uh, going forward in order to get the answers that we need, which will ultimately tell us whether the species is recovered uh, in the end. And so we'll concentrate right now just on the left side of that graphic that Deanne previously proposed. Um, and that's really what the land manager is involved in. Uh, and, and a lot of our land managers that are doing SKR land management are already doing this to some extent. Um, so this is really the annual adaptive monitoring and management plan. Uh, it's kind of already incorporated into many land managers annual work plan. Uh, and so you start at the top with the updated habitat suitability model uh, and population units and you work your way around to the right. Uh, the difference with this plan uh, compared to most of them, uh, traditionally all this data was generated by the land manager themselves, whoever's running that reserve or that conserved area. That, that data didn't really make it out of that specific location. Uh, it was stored on their computer. It was used for their benefit to gauge whether their management was effective or their monitoring showed a decline or increase in their localized area. Where this new plan, this, this kind of takes it to a higher level. And they, we, we try to compile this data, as Deanne said, through the data aggregation. We'll get into all this in the next couple of slides. But the, the big thing is that the data that was previously stored on the computer now goes to a, a higher level analysis. And so next slide. So we start at the top, like I said, uh, really the technical team uses the satellite imagery that Wayne talked about earlier. Uh, and they take that and they update that habitat model yearly and they update those population units yearly. And so then they take these maps, these newly updated maps of where the good habitat is and you know the population units and they distribute them to all the land managers that are working to conserve SKR to include in their annual work plans and kind of guide them uh, on identifying those locations where maybe you wanna concentrate your management, maybe where you wanna concentrate your monitoring, uh, trying to more effectively spend your money and your time uh, managing SKR. So this will be a very important tool for a lot of our local land managers uh, going forward in order to concentrate uh, their efforts and get the best data available. So once that happens, we move on to the next slide, which will be up updating those range-wide monitoring units and sampling sites. And that's what I, was, I just kind of jumped ahead and mentioned before. So this is an, an example of Lake Matthews Reserve. It's one of our larger reserves here in Western Riverside County at 12,600 acres. Of those 12,600 acres, this is probably a good snapshot of where SKR would be located. Uh, it shows highly suitable habitat. And so I, as a land manager, would go out there and you know want to concentrate my management or my monitoring uh, within those green shaded areas. Uh, and then so once we do that, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. So we'll collect that monitoring data and we'll do this through live captures. And again, as Wayne said before, we're, we're hashing out that grid sizes. For us going, uh, going forward, we're more flexible with our grid size. Our data typically uh, that we generate through our live trapping uh, helps gauge our effectiveness of our management strategies, where others are really like USGS are really focusing intensely on in population sizes and whatnot. So we can maybe come down to their size or go up to the grid size, but it'll all be ironed out in the future. We also wanna get some qualitative and quantitative habitat uh, assessment done. And so we wanna know if the management that we're doing is effective, uh, you know, or do we need to do uh, some kind of revision to our management plans? And so that'll be, all be part of the collecting of the monitoring data. Uh, next slide. So once all this data, you know, we collect all this data and it typically sat on our computers here at our individual locations or with individual landowners, this now gets forwarded uh, to the data manager. And so that'll be a central repository, whether that's USGS or CBI or some other entity, uh, they will take that data and they'll aggregate it and then do a further analysis on it which brings us to the next slide. Uh, the technical team will then get it and do a further analysis to review the science and the monitoring data, they update the status and the trends of the SKR 
uh, annually. And once all those updates are completed, that information then flows to another group, uh, the implementation group. So this is where we start concentrating on the right side of the graphic. So the land managers keep doing what they're doing, trying not to increase any additional burden on them, uh, filling in the gaps where we can. But once this data is aggregated, uh, the technical group updates those maps annually, but also kicks out this new information to this implementation group. And so this implementation group, go ahead with the next slide, really becomes that range-wide, that upper level decision-making body. So if you look at the kind of plan as a three-legged stool in a sense, you have your monitoring as one leg, your management as another leg, and maybe your um, security or threats as a third leg. The the implementation group looks at that from a higher level. They look at the top of the stool, how it all comes together. And so they will then make recommendations for refining the management, the monitoring, identify any research priorities regarding new threats or new information that's needed to complete the picture of the SKR status uh, and trends. In addition, if there's any gaps, uh, you know, again, we don't want to increase the burdens too much on folks. And so if there's any gaps where we need additional information, it's gonna be up to that implementation group to seek and find funding uh, to fill in those gaps. And so really they're also there as the experts to ask so reserve managers, if they have specific issues with their specific property uh, going forward, they're there really as an asset to help manage the SKR in a cohesive fashion uh, from that higher level viewpoint. And so next slide. So once that implementation group kind of looks at the data and identifies those gaps, research opportunities and whatnot, it gets kicked back again uh, to, to the managers uh, to basically go back into their toolbox. Uh, and there's, we're developing an SKR communication portal to ask questions and whatnot uh, to refine their management and their monitoring strategies within their individual areas. And so really the cycle provides a closed feedback loop that was previously lacking. We didn't really have that you know, kick back out to make those big higher level decisions and then flow back into the reserve managers. So the feedback loop also provides an annual status update to those policy and regulatory folks uh, who are basically determining the status of the SKR and the recovery efforts and their effectiveness. Uh, but it also helps the reserve managers, the cons conservation managers, uh, with developing their annual work plans. Where do they need to do, need to do additional management? Is their monitoring showing uh, that their management is effective uh, and their populations are increasing or if they're decreasing, how do you adaptively manage for those uh, instances? So going forward, next slide. The, all this information is basically provided during that annual management uh, and monitoring cycle. And so we understand and we want this plan to continually evolve. Uh, we don't wanna have this as a static plan. And so with that, we make several recommendations. One, we need to update the SKR reserve and locality databases annually. We need to refine that draft SKR habitat and population units annually. And we need to detail and implement the monitoring program. Some of those little things that Wayne was talking about, grid size and some of the concerns of the other uh, comments here, the grid size, we need to refine that, get down to a good, you know, uh, medium uh, size that everybody can work with. Uh, we need to detail and implement the data management system, uh, what we're going to collect, what variables are necessary, and then going forward, maybe we discover, you know, this wasn't necessary. Uh, it's not telling us enough information, and maybe we don't have to go through the effort to collect that. Uh, but essentially, what we're trying to do is streamline all the updates to the SKR habitat model the habitat units and the population units, and then fill in those gaps, whether that's through the population monitoring or a connectivity assessment, further genetic analysis. Ideally, we have to monitor and we have to manage to learn how to monitor and manage going forward. And so this isn't a static process. It's a learning thing going forward. And hopefully this plan allows that flexibility uh, for all of our land managers and for those higher level decision policy type makers. Uh, with that, I think I have to turn it back over to Wayne. Okay, me again. Um, actually, I'll be handing it over quickly, I think, to Princess, but she's really the implementation uh, expert here. But we did establish a preliminary coordination framework, the monitoring strategy and the data management strategy. And now the next steps are let's get going and start to implement and, and get the data. Um, and like I said, for the monitoring strategy, the, we need to 
establish the, the sampling areas, design the first year sample, get data, and then refine. So um, I think I'll just hand it over to Princess to take us through, I believe, the next few slides. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so access to the plan is definitely available in several different places. It's um, available on the, uh, in the gallery on databasing, also on both of our websites, CBI and RCHCA's website. And if you're you know, a little old school, we do have some copies of the plan. However, I feel that the digital version will serve you much better. And the reason that I feel that way is because this plan is alive and breathing. It's something that we didn't want to create just to sit on the shelf. We want you to use it. There's going to be, as you've heard um, in the presentation, you know, opportunities for us to fine tune this based on, you know, new technology that might be available. Or after we get out into the field and we're using it, there may be opportunities to update things because they might have been identified in theory, but now we have different information that supports a, a particular methodology that needs to be revised. So it's definitely alive and we um, want to keep it that way but it's available in those places. And then, like I said, if at any time you'd like a hard copy, just shoot us an email and we'll get a hard copy mailed out to you. Next slide, please. So how did this all come about? Um, this particular project would have not been possible if it were not for the partners. And you heard Deanne mention that there were 30 different agencies and over a hundred different um, experts that took part in, the, in developing this plan. And, and all of that part was great, you know, the, the design of the plan and the creating the document, the sort of cookbook to be able to use, um, you know, for for our uh, for our result efforts going forward. But you know, the next largest step is really implementation, and that's going to take, you know, all of these partners, you know, and, and some of you. And you might find ways that you might be able to assist based on your expertise in the areas of the data management on the technical side, on the reserve side, or on the implementation side. Um, we manage for threatened and endangered species. This year, our CHCA is celebrating its 25th anniversary. And, and it's been a long time coming. A lot of the stuff that you've heard in this plan is based off of experience and lessons learned. When we, I came to this agency a number of years ago, as well as with Brian, when we even, I dreamed of the concept of a range-wide management and monitoring plan at that time, you know, so many years ago, it was like, that's gonna be impossible. But now with, you know, advanced technology, you know, this habitat suitability model, utilizing satellite imagery, and then us recognizing that as entities, we need to share information and resources across boundaries, because as we know, species don't recognize geographical boundaries. Like they don't know that they went from Riverside County into San Diego County. And so we kind of have to think about it from that collaborative approach if we are really going to truly recover the species, which is our overall goal. And so I believe we're setting a new paradigm for species management. I'm hoping that the wildlife agencies, as they now develop, you know, now we're developing these multi-species habitat conservation plans that are encompassing hundreds of acres of land across jurisdictional boundaries you have to take into consideration all of the partners that are going to be involved with species recovery. And so I'm hoping that this sort of sets the standard for streamlining some of those processes in the beginning, as opposed to waiting for us like this at the end, but better late than never. And so I'm just really humbled um, to be a part of this group as I know that everybody else is here and we are definitely looking to recover the species and there will be more information to come and with that, I will turn it over to answer some additional questions um, that you might have had. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, we, we have had a couple of additional questions come in. Um, one that just came into the chat, and Deanne has actually answered it, but I just wanted to read it aloud so that everyone could, could see and hear it. Um, the question was, are there additional costs in implementing this plan on the land manager. And Deanne has said it'll depend. Um, there will be new monitoring standards to adopt, which may be more or less different from what has been done by the land manager. However, there will also be opportunities to benefit from coordinated fundraising, sharing of resources, 
and help implementing monitoring with tools and supporting data. And we think everyone wins if the, res if the result is SKR conservation and recovery. So I just wanted to share that. Um, Deanne, it looks like you had also answered another question, I think, that just came into the Q&A box from Eileen um, about will the collective results of the monitoring and management be publicly available? I'm not sure if everyone can see that response, so would you like to share your thoughts on that before we move on? Sure. Um, well, that is uh, one of the kinds of decisions that will be made collectively by the data management team, um, which we invite you to weigh in on uh, as we, we roll out and um, implement these strategies and plans. Um, right now, I mean, I, uh, you, you can imagine it will be, um, there are considerations about um, sensitive data. Right now, we're sharing the generalized, the habitat suitability map, the biogeographic map, those generalized distribution data are publicly available. And I believe that we've got, um, we have a private group in Data Basin that you can join. The SKR stakeholders um, have a login. And so uh, we'll probably keep the point observations private to the group. So it depends on what you mean by public, but certainly available to the people who need it for SKR conservation and research. Well, it looks like we're mostly caught up there. Oh, we might have one more coming in. Um, I, I did want to ask a quick question um, and maybe make a comment. Deanne, you had mentioned, um, you were talking about a collector app um, for potentially help with collecting some of the data. And I was curious if you, um, I'm sure are familiar with iNaturalist and some of those types of apps that are out there. We've had some success using that on our biodiversity days. We have different events at our um, properties and bioblitzes and, and have had a lot of success um, with folks using iNaturalist apps. So was wondering if that was on your radar as a possibility. I love iNaturalist. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't want to participate in observing our natural world? Um, the monitoring, the standardized monitoring data set will have its fields that um, are carefully crafted for um, allowing us to evaluate the, popular, the, the SKR um, trends, status and trends. Um, so whatever tools are, are offered and uh, recommended will allow the land manager to collect that data in its standard form, um, both content wise and all the vocabularies that are needed to describe um, those observations in that standard method and format wise. And so when the data manager uh, takes the data and aggregates it, it goes together nicely into a database that then can support the cycle that we showed you. So um, my, I don't know for sure, but my guess is that iNaturalist would not be that robust um, uh, tool that we're looking for. Uh, our CHCA has been using a thing called Collector App and um, it's been useful to them. And we think that we could easily um, modify, you know, create the forms in that collector app. And we imagine it would be helpful to the land manager to be able to bring that habitat suitability map out into the field to look at where they are standing. And is this a um, part of that suitability map that's recommended for setting down plots? Things like that will make it just easy and then easy to report up and share the data. So we've yet to develop those things and we um, will be, that's part of the implementation phase which we're entering now. That's great. I didn't realize that collector app was the name of the app. I thought it was like a generic <laughs> for collecting information. So that's so interesting. And yeah, the collector app is made from, I mean, it's developed by ESRI. Uh, and so it seamlessly integrates with ArcMap and ArcGIS. And so uh, it's really useful for us because it creates the database and the GIS layers like in real time. So it's, it's you know, useful and it, you can 
make any kind of oh. database or you know spreadsheet you want to have it upload that data seamlessly. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's see. Um, I think we're all caught up. Are there any um, final questions that folks have? Maybe we can give them just a few more. Oh, here we go. Um, a question from Gina. Um, she says, I, I had heard Esri was moving away from Collector and will stop supporting it in a few years. Um, that was a comment. They might want to check before adopting it uh, for new projects going ahead. I'm not sure if that's something that you guys have heard of. No, I didn't, but that's something definitely we want to look into. Yeah. Uh, there was an earlier question. I just wanted to touch base on it regarding uh, other species within SKR habitat and, and going forward and in some of the costs. And so again, I mentioned it before. And again, it has to be practical. This plan has to be practical. And we're making every effort to use existing monitoring uh, going forward uh, to achieve our goals and, and identify that effective population size and recovery ultimately. But there may be additional costs, as, as Deanne said. But also, I mean, a lot of our reserves are not single species, right? So, you know, for instance, Lake Matthews Reserve covers 65 species under one MSHCP. And there's another larger umbrella MSHCP that covers 146 species in their Western Riverside area. So there's a variety of things. And we are aware that land managers have to, you know, split their money, uh, split the pie up uh, multiple ways. And so we are very working very hard not to focus all their efforts on SKR, but incorporate it into their existing management plans. And yes, other species definitely will benefit from the management toolbox and the management strategy for SKR. Uh, since we've been managing for SKR using a variety of tools, grazing, burning, mowing, whatnot, we have burrowing owl have moved into the area. Plantago erecta has popped up, which is Kino checker spot butterfly, host plant. Uh, so there's a lot of other benefits. And if you manage by the community or a guild, rather than just focusing on SKR, uh, we're hoping you can achieve your management goals for SKR, but also work it into your annual work plans for a lot of other species. And those tools aren't, you know, mutually exclusive to SKR. They're very useful for everything. If you're trying to get rid of grasses or, or novel weeds or whatnot. So take a look at it, even if you aren't managing SKR, there's just good information in there. Great. Um, we had a, another comment come in and then a question, quick comment um, about the collector app. Someone says that Esri is, is moving to survey one, two, three. So something to maybe, maybe check into. Um, we had a question from Pauline. Is data basin related to ArcGIS? And oh, and another comment about Esri also has a new app called Field Maps that included collector. Uh, but the question is, uh, is data basin related to ArcGIS? Wynn, you want to take that or shall I? No. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar with database and just go there and explore, there's um, it's databasin.org. It's free. Um, it is for someone who has no GIS skills or programming skills whatsoever to explore data, combine data, visualize, create maps, download data. Um, it's, it's, um, really a platform for conservation, for spatial data sharing and use on the web that doesn't require GIS skills. You can certainly export data layers between um, ArcGIS and databasin and so on, it, but th that's not the purpose of databasin. It's really a, a, a data sharing platform for spatial information and for conservationists. A good question. Um, Whitney, uh, so there's so much interest in yes. this and expertise out there. Um, I uh, invite you all to send us your contact information. We'll put you on the distribution list to keep you apprised of what's going on. And if we convene, when we convene the data manager management strategy implementation group or the, um, the various implementation teams, uh, you are welcome to, to join them, depending on your interest in the parts of the different uh, aspects of implementing the plan. So thank you. This hopefully is just the beginning of this conversation, not the end. And in case anyone did not see that, um, Deanne provided her contact information in the chat box. So feel free to, to email her directly with your info. 
Great. Any any other questions for our panelists? Okay. Uh, well, with that, um, before I close us out here, and are there any last comments from our presenters? Anything you want to share before we we close out for the day? Final thoughts? All good. I just really appreciate the opportunity to to talk uh, here on your conservation lecture series. Thanks so much, Whitney. I just want to thank, thank everybody for attending and you know giving us this opportunity to share it with you guys. So. You guys have any questions? Let us know. Yeah, and it's nice seeing a lot of old friend names in the list. <laughs> People I haven't seen in a while. Hi. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much, um, all four of you, for coming and talking about this plan. That was a great presentation. A lot of information, very succinctly provided. So we really appreciate that. And thank you again to all of our attendees for joining us, for supporting the lecture series and for asking such great questions today. We really appreciate your participation. So um, thank you again. Do keep an eye out for the recording. We'll get that up in the next couple of weeks. And other than that, um, have a lovely day and we will see you next time. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>